Hey guys! Um, so I, a while ago, did a video which was like reading Camp NaNoWriMo stuff. I think it was called What I Wrote During Camp NaNoWriMo Part 1. Because I knew I was going to read the whole thing. Fortunately, at least one person out there liked it enough to ask for more. Wow, that feels so much better in terms of my hair. Um, it looks atrocious, but whatever. Um, so I'm going to read more today. I've jury-rigged my t little camera thing and then my um, document above it, so we're just going to start reading. If you don't know what's going on, you should probably watch the other video, but basically these are two lesbians. Or maybe it's a lesbian and a bi girl. I think they're two lesbians. And they're in love, and they do high school, and one is trans and the other is cis. And if your new, 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 then you uh, should know that this was written for Camp Ninaremo, so a lot of it, all the contractions are taken out and it's worded weirdly, so I'm going to be reading a mix of that and what I do. Now that my epic disclaimer is out of the way, let's jump in. Scene 4. Paula tells Aquila about her experiences with the first surgeon she looked at. And Aquila says, I love you, as does Paula. The two of them sat in Aquila's car, eating sandwiches. The windows were down, and the radio was turned to some station playing a love song by a band apparently called Incongruent. Suddenly, Paula groaned. Are you okay? Aquila asked, leaning across the center console. Which took me forever to figure out what that was called. Uh, yeah, it's just... She blew out of her mouth. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you the story of my surgery consultation yesterday. Okay. Akila took a bite of her sandwich. Okay, so this guy. This guy, right? My mom and I decided to look at him because he's an adolescent plastic surgeon, which seemed kind of creepy, but whatever. Maybe he's a philanthropist or something and works on deformed kids. Well, first thing I noticed is that there were all these brochures with people who are clearly in their 20s and have clearly had lots of work done. Really? Yeah. He's setting, like, 15-year-olds up to believe they ought to look like movie stars as teenagers. That sounds a little sketchy, but I guess he has a business to maintain. I wrote it off, too. <laughs> So I get called back, and my mom and I go in there, and we see this nurse, and she kicks my mom out. No. No. Yeah. She said that the doctor likes to make sure the surgery is really what the patient wants, which I get. So I figure my mom will come in after he makes sure that I want this. Then... The nurse then hands me more brochures, talks about the things the surgeon did to her when she was a teenager, and so that everybody comes out more attractive than they were when they went in. Which is not relevant, because I am not trying to change anything visible. Right. Akila had put down her sandwich and was totally focused on Paula. Right. She also talks about how good it feels. Which is confusing, because we're talking about surgery. But I guess it must be relatively without pain or something. <laughs> Um, so then she leaves, and the surgeon comes in, and he orders me to strip. So I do. What do I know about how this works? So I strip, and he circles me, gazing over every inch of my body. He then busts out a cloth measuring tape, measures my dick, and tells me that he will not need an additional graft. I kid you not. His first words to me, after commanding me to strip, were, You will not need an additional graft. No way! Not even a hello? Or so why are you here? Nope! And so I'm like, okay, you're creeping me out, but maybe it's all business, so whatever. <laughs> so I say that's good, and he nods. So I think he's done there, and my mom can come in, but then he grabs uh, my breasts. No. And says, what about these pancakes? No! Yeah, he's all like, listen... Girls have boobs. If you want to be attractive, then you're gonna have to have boobs. 
I don't like girl. I don't like girls without boobs. And I'm like, great for you. At this point, I reach for my clothes. I'm done here, and I'm trying to get dressed when he grabs my arm and says, "And I quote, I always give the girls I get to see in action a discount." No. Yeah. This creeper probably is raping a bunch of people, girls mostly, who are 13 years old. So I tell him that we're done here. He gets a little closer, so I kick him in the balls. That shuts him up. So I get dressed and walked out, and I tell my mom all this on the way home. So she's doing whatever lawyery stuff she does against creeps, and we're looking for a new surgeon. Are you okay? Yeah, he didn't do anything too bad. And you're sure you'll find a better surgeon? Oh, for sure. Don't worry about me, Kiki. But I'm... We're scrolling a little bit. <sighs> uh, why are you not scrolling? Okay. Um... Oh, for sure. Don't worry about me, Kiki. But I'm sure not going to go to another adolescent plastic surgeon. Gross. Paula ate the last bite of her sandwich and crumpled up her wrapper. I think we should head back. It's already 12.23. Okay, <laughs> Akila said as she started her car. Just, just promise me you'll be safe. She undid the parking brake and put the car in rear. Take care of yourself, okay? She turned her head around to look while she backed out and said, I love you. Paula's eyes grew wide. What did you say? Akila turned around and shifted the car into drive. I, uh, I know it's too soon and all, but I love you. I love you too. I love you, Akila. Akila smiled. That's good. The two of them spent the whole ride back to school laughing. <laughs> it's a really creepy scene, and I don't imagine if I ever were to pursue this book it would get, like, published. But, um, it's important to highlight all the creepy stuff that surgeons sometimes make trans women go through, and a lot of these trans women are so desperate that they don't really think they have a choice, so. Uh, number five. Akila goes with Paula to her second interview with the man who will be her surgeon. I didn't actually finish this scene, so. Are you sure about this? Relax, Kiki, Paula said, unbuckling her seatbelt. It's an interview, not the actual surgery itself. And yeah, I am. But I want you to be, too. No, not just about Dr. Dillamond or whoever. Paula shut her door, and Akila closed hers. This isn't wicked, you know. His name is Dr. DeVereaux. <laughs> Akila smiled. That's why I said, or whoever. They started walking. But I wasn't really talking about Dr. DeVereaux. I was talking about the surgery itself. We've been over this before, Paula murmured as Akila held open the door to the office building. I know, but... But? It's not your body! I just... I just... <sighs> you just what? They reached through the elevator and Paula jammed the button. The doors opened and the two girls stepped in. Akila reached out to the fourth floor button and, after a nod, pushed it. I don't mind if you have a dick. That's all. Paula groaned. I'm not doing this for you. I know, and I didn't expect you to be doing so. I just... Make sure this is only for you. They arrived on the fourth floor and walked out as the doors opened. They entered the waiting room. Finally, after checking in and being waved directly into the back and being left alone in the waiting room, Paula spoke. It's... It is all for me. But it is a slightly coerced will. If I didn't need it for a gendered society and legal changes, it might not be the decision I come to. I'll be with you in less than a minute, a voice echoed through the door. But it's still mine. Okay. Uh, I have another scene that I didn't write, so whatever. Scene six. They're at the hospital. Akila visits Paula instead of going to her afternoon classes. Paula opened her eyes as she heard the door open. She expected to see a nurse or a doctor, or maybe one of her parents. So her eyes widened in surprise when she saw who it was. Akila? She asked over the gentle beeps of the room. What are you doing here? 
I'm visiting you, obviously. Akila responded with a smile. Very short scene. I was in the middle of writing it, based entirely off the next scene. Scene 7. They are at the hospital. Paula visits Akila instead of going to graduation. Eh, eh, some foreshadowing. Akila opened her eyes as she heard the door open. She expected to see a nurse or a doctor, maybe one of her parents, so her eyes widened in surprise when she saw who it was. That's literally the same sentence. Paula? She asked over the gentle beeps of her room. Hi, love. Paula answered with a smile. Can I come in? Of course. Akila moved to sit up, but stopped with a sudden groan. Easy there. Paula crossed the room and sat in the chair next to Akila. There's no need to worry about trying to sit up. What are you doing here? Akila asked as she sank back into the pillows. You know what day it is? Paula smiled. Yep, it's the first day of your recovery after your surgery to fix your clavicle. Akila rolled her eyes. It's graduation. What are you doing here? Spending time with my girlfriend, whom I love. But you worked so long and hard for this day. You fought so hard. We're scrolling, maybe? Um, I did, and this is the best reward. You're missing the point! Akila sighed. You need to get over to the school right now and make it into the gym so you can walk. You even made them change their policy so they'd use your name. It doesn't matter to me whether they call me Paula or Paula. My birth name will still be on the diploma itself. And the most important person in my life won't even be there. Wait, could your parents not make it? No, Sally, you are the most important person in my life. That's really a bold statement to make after eight months, Akila said, doing her best to sound stern and slightly disappointed. Paula leaned over and whispered into Akila's ear, You're not fooling me. Then kissed her on the cheek. It's almost nine months anyway, she said, straightening up. Ugh, Akila responded, I give up. I know you're not going anywhere. I'm going to pick up my diploma later this week, and if you write a letter, I can get yours, too. I'm not sure how much writing I'm going to be doing for a while. Right. I can write it and you can sign it? I'm sure that will work. Thanks. That's a very kind offer. No problem. They sat in silence together, basking in the presence of each other. Finally, Paula put out, pulled out her phone and put on Unseen Unheard by Incongruent. Finally, Paula pulled out her phone and put on Unseen Unheard by Incongruent, a summation of all the feelings they had felt for each other and would ever feel. Just as the album ended, the door opened and a doc and in strolled a doctor. Side note, they would never be alone long enough to listen to an entire album. Not in a hospital. Maybe in Paula's recovery suite, but never in a hospital. Uh... Hello, Akila. He smiled at her. Who are you? I'm Paula, your girlfriend. The two girls smiled at this. I'm Dr. Sunyadi, the surgeon who operated on Akila. We're going to talk about her health, so you should probably go. N no, it's okay. She can stay. Unfortunately, Akila, that's not your call to make. We're going to stop there. Very exciting. Just kidding, we're continuing. Uh, unfortunately, Akila, that's not your call. As mature as you are, you're still a minor, so it's up to your parents for a few more days. I'm sorry. It's totally fine. Paula stood up. I should probably get something to eat anyway. I promise that I'll come back later, okay? Conscience of the, conscious of the surgeon. She leaned over and kissed the for, uh, Akila's forehead, then stood up. She shook hands with the surgeon. It was nice to meet you, Doctor. You as well. She reached the door and turned around. I love you, she said. I love you. Akila returned and watched Paula close the door. Dr. Sanyari sat down in the newly unoccupied seat. She's really important enough to you that you'd really let her have access to your medical information? Of course, Akila said. One day, it's going to be part of her job. Uh, eight. Is this a fucking proposal? Epilogue two, because there's going to be an epilogue before they go to college. And there's going to be this epilogue, so. 
Akilah stood up as soon as she heard the doorbell. Coming! she shouted. She winced as her patella slipped out of joint again, but she simply reached over and shoved it back into place, then walked to the door. She unlocked it and opened it. She gasped. Brit? What on earth are you doing here? She shrugged. It's time, she simply said. Akilah frowned. Time for what? Her frown deepened as Brit held out a rose. Oh no, she mumbled. I'm just a messenger, she reassured Akilah. This rose has nothing to do with me. If you come along, I'm sure you'll figure everything out in due time. Okay. Akilah grabbed her keys and wallet and followed Brit to her car. They both got, they both got in and Brit started driving. Where are we going? Akilah asked after about a minute. I'm not allowed to tell you that. Why are we going wherever we're going? I'm not allowed to tell you that either. Whose idea was this excursion? I'm not allowed to tell you that either. Akilah sighed in frustration. Well, what can you tell me? Brit sighed as well, but hers was sadder. I can tell you that I'm really, really sorry for the asshole I was senior year. Scratch that. All of high school. I was a totally fucked excuse for a friend. I... I want you to know that I've changed since starting college. I want to make up for it, and so please don't get mad that the person who organized this excursion, as you put it, for my involvement. I asked, because I wanted to apologize in a meaningful way, but I'm afraid that I might have ruined your day, so I'm sorry for that, too. It's okay, Akilah said. I forgive you. I forgave you long ago. She saw tears swelling up in Brit's eyes. Can you continue to drive? I don't have to, Brit replied as she pulled over next to a field that felt a little too familiar to Akilah. Where are we? At your transfer station, also known as the vacant lot that used to be the location of my old house that we moved out of freshman year. Oh, that was why it felt so familiar. We had our first cheer party here. Akilah! A voice shouted from the from outside the car. Time to go! Yep, the perk of being rich is that you are always hosting. So you're always making connections. It fucking sucked. I'm sorry, Akila said. You have nothing to apologize for, Bert responded. Neither do you. Akila opened the door. Thanks for driving me. Don't forget your rose. Brit handed it to her. Thanks. She stepped out of the car. Akila! The voice was definitely Rusty's. It's okay to forgive yourself, Brit. She closed the car door and turned around. What is it, Rusty? She shouted. Where are you? Over by the porch. He waved and she walked over to him. Wow, it's not a vacant lot if there's a porch. Anyway. Um, as she got closer, she saw he was... I should say that every time you hear me repeat a sentence, it's because my camera died and I don't have my headphones to listen and hear what I said last, so. Um. Over by the porch, he waved, and she walked over to him. As she got closer, she saw that he was leaning against two bikes. What's up with the bikes? she asked. We're pedaling to your next location, he said. But first, he handed her a rose he'd been holding behind his back. What am I supposed to do with it? These. Fortunately, your bicycle comes with a tube that may or may not have been, and probably was not designed specifically to hold two lovely roses. He bent over, picked up a tube, and handed it to her. She placed the roses inside, and then he handed her the cap, which she then placed on the tube. He walked his bike down a path towards the road perpendicular to the one Brit drove her along, and Akila followed him. Neither of them spoke until they reached the road, where they stopped walking. Scrolling, scrolling. What's going on? Akila, I'm not able to tell you that. You should have figured that out by now. Can you tell me where we're going? Rusty hesitated, then shrugged. I'm not supposed to, but you'll know it when you see it. With that, he climbed on his bike and started pedaling down the street. Akila heard, hurriedly followed him. You remember when we used to hang out in this neighborhood all the time? Rusty asked once, once she was within e earshot. Yeah, Akila responded. I'm almost unable to believe how far apart all of us from Westerberg High have drifted. 
Not you and Paula, Rusty pointed out. True, but that's a little different. Speaking of Paula, how are you two? Good, good, good. I love her so much. Rusty smiled. That's good. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking about asking her to marry me. Really? Does she know that? Nah. If she did, she'd try to beat me to it. We're scrolling, scrolling. She'd try to beat me to it. Would that be a bad thing? I guess not. She paused. Why do you ask? Just curious. They kept biking and shouting about everything under the sun, except... They kept biking, chatting about everything under the sun, except for where they were going. Finally, Akila realized where they were. Westerberg High? Akila asked. Are you kidding me? Nope, Rusty answered. This is your destination, for now. Do I have to go somewhere else before someone tells me what's going on? Nah, I just meant that you'll go places after you find out what's going on. Okay. They reached the front walkway and stopped biking. Akila got off her bike and stood there, looking around. That's Paula's car. I wonder why it's there, Rusty mused, a smile on his face. Should I go inside? Scrolling. Probably. And I'd take the roses, too. But maybe not the tape. Tube. I'm not sure. I think I'll keep it, just in case. Okay, that's your call. Akila sat her bike down on the ground and walked towards the old high school of everyone. She pushed the doors open and saw a rose on the ground with a string tied around it and a piece of paper on the string. She bent over and turned the paper over, reading the text out loud. Three roses for the Trinity. Nine for me. Twelve for you. Make your way to the auditorium if you feel find yourself so inclined. Akila walked through the halls of the old building, surprised to find it completely empty. It seemed so different from when she was in high school, even from when she had visited as a graduate. But it also felt familiar. So much of who she had, who she was, had been shaped by this school, especially in her senior year. That was a whirlwind. It couldn't even be a book. She mumbled to herself. Because in hindsight, it was so unbelievably perfect. Finally, she reached the auditorium. She pushed open the doors and forced herself to keep walking while she absorbed what was going on. Someone had turned on a single spotlight in the dark room, and there was a person under the spotlight. Paula. Paula was under the spotlight. She was kneeling and surrounded by something. Akila got closer. It looked like Paula was holding something, and she was definitely smiling. She was surrounded by what looked like nine roses. Akila got even closer. It was a box. The heart of Akila, or Akila's heart, and unbeknownst to her, Paula's heart, started beating fast. Started beating faster. She was at the edge of the stage. It was a ring box. <gasps> that's a proposal. She beat you to it. Anyway, that's all I wrote during camp now. Oh, I mean, I wrote some more stuff, but that's all I wrote for that story. So that's that. Hope you liked it. Hope I can do something with it in the future. I really like it. Really excites me. Anyway, bye. And I hope you have a great day. Now, bye.